So uh, this was all sort of adding on to what Kant says. Kant, what he actually says is that um, we can easily dismiss this case. These are going to be the two that are hard to distinguish. Um, this is what he's saying on 13. <coughs> Okay, so here comes uh, his attempt to distinguish these two, three and four, which he thinks are difficult to distinguish. He says, by contrast, sorry, so let me say it one more time. I made up a third example of the shopkeeper. That's not Kant's. <coughs> the shopkeeper who charges a fair price because he likes that little kid. Now, the shopkeeper example that Kant talks about is two, and he thinks it's easy to dismiss. It's self interest the hard, so, so now he needs examples to distinguish these two. These are going to be the hard cases. He says, by contrast now, to preserve one's life is one's duty. And besides, everyone has an immediate inclination to do so. Okay, so everybody has an immediate inclination to preserve their lives. And it's the duty to preserve their lives. So you can see that we're going to have a case where somebody acts to preserve their life because they have an immediate inclination for it. And we're going to have a case where somebody acts to preserve their life because that's what they recognize duty would require. But on account of this, it's often, they per, they per, but because of their inclination, they preserve their lives in conformity with duty, not from duty. By contrast, if adversities and hopeless grief have entirely taken away the taste for life. So imagine you meet a person who does not have an inclination to go on living. If the unfortunate, if the unfortunate man, strong of soul, more indignant about his fate than despondent or dejected, wishes for death, that's what their inclination is, yet preserves his life without loving it, not from inclination or fear, but from duty, then the maxim has moral consequences. That's a case for Kant. So I want to say, Kant is not saying that the only way a person can be morally praiseworthy is if they want to die but overcome that inclination and preserve their life out of duty. He's talking about that case because he thinks that will clarify what it means to act from duty. Um, Okay. Questions about that? Okay, so he mentions this word maxim here. Um, he mentions this idea of the person's uh, his maxim as a moral contract. So I want to talk about that in just a minute, but I want to finish up talking about these Right, so the case where a person has an, the case which he assumes is the typical one, where all of us have an inclination to continue living, is case three. He makes this artificial case of somebody who's suicidal, but continues to live because that's their duty in order to bring out the contrast to case four. Um, notice that so forget about one for a second. In two, a person acts some way in a certain way because they have some further goal. So the reason that they do this, whatever this is, the reason they act this way, is to bring about some further goal. I want you to notice that the goal, what it is that they're willing, the end that they have, in three and four is the same. So in three and four, in cases three and four, the person acting takes that action to be good in itself, not because it will create some further goal. Let me say that again. In case two, 
the shopkeeper, for example, charges a fair price because that's the way to bring about some further goal that he wants, namely, keep his reputation fair. In three or four, the shopkeeper, let's say, in my, my shopkeeper, the shopkeeper is charging a fair price because he likes that kid. And in four, where the shopkeeper is charging the fair price because he recognizes that that's what morality requires, that's what his duty is. In both of those cases, there's not some further end being served by acting in this way. In three, he takes that action, charging a fair price, to be a good thing. He's not looking to increase his reputation. He's not looking for the kid to go back and tell his parents that he's nice. Because of his warm feeling, he recognizes this to be something that he wants to do. In four, because of his moral sense, because of his recognition of what morality requires, he recognizes this to be something worth doing for its own sake also. So in three and four, the goal is the same, namely the action itself. The difference between three and four is the reason why he takes that action itself to be valid. But there's no further end beyond that action that's being served instrumentally. Okay, so some people might say that in both three and four, other questions? So when I'm talking about three and four, we you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Some people would say, so this is a sort of a delicate plan. Because some people think that, and in fact, in most ethics classes, if you've learned something about Kant, you have been told that for Kant, morally praiseworthy actions cannot be based on desires. What I want to say about that is, it depends what you mean by desire. Um, and in one sense of desire, uh, it's perfectly natural to talk about um, acting, well, it's perfectly natural to talk about our desire to do our duty, our desire to be moral people, our desire to act as morality would. And if that's how we're using the term desire, Kant has no problem with it. That would be okay. So if we want to describe four as at the shopkeeper charging a fair price because he recognizes that's what his duty is, that's what is morally required. If we want to describe that as he acted this way because he had the desire to do what was right. That's perfectly fine. Um, the point is, and, and, and similarly, if, if we want to say he had a desire to charge the kid to fair price, that's fine. What's important to Kant is what those desires are based on, if anything. That's the way to distinguish these two. So, um, in case three, if there's no further justification for that design, if he just happens to like that little kid, if he just happens to have an inclination to charge that kid a fair price because he likes him, that's a case of number three. If he charges a fair price because he has a desire to do what's right. Not because he happens to like this kid. Not because he has an empirical pull toward him, But because he recognizes that that's what morality requires. That's what his duty is. If that recognition is the basis for his desire, then we have a case of four. So, I myself don't like the word desire because it's ambiguous between whether it's ungrounded and happens to be something we feel ourselves liking for no particular reason, 
or grounded in a recognition, for example, that morality requires something. So I prefer, and usually Kant uses the following word to mean something like ungrounded desire, empirical desire, pull that we just happen to feel, inclination. So inclination is uh, and something like an ungrounded desire. And if we're acting from inclination, if we're acting on the basis of the feeling that we just happen to have at a moment, if, if this is an empirical and contingent pull, well then, even if it's in conformity with what morality requires, that action has no moral worth. That's not a pra morally praiseworthy person, or at least that action is not. Okay. Um, Um, let's stop here. Um, we'll, on Friday, um, continue talking about part one. You still don't have to recast that. Um, make sure you're clear about what I've been talking about here. I have your papers for you. Um, if you have uh, questions or comments about these, you absolutely should come soon.